Good morning and welcome to the 14th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone in the public gallery to please switch off your electronic devices or switch them to silent so they don't affect the committee's work this morning? Item 1 is decision on taking business in private. Do we agree to take items 3 and 4 in private this morning? Thank you. Item 2 is the 2016-17 audit of NHS Tayside. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, Shona Robison, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, Paul Gray, Director General, Health and Social Care and Chief Executive, NHS Scotland, and Christine McLaughlin, Director of Health Finance, Scottish Government. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement. Thanks very much, uh, Convener. Uh, the committee will now have had the chance to read the, the latest report from Grant Thornton on financial governance in NHS Tayside and will no doubt share uh, my concerns at the, the findings of that review. As I've said before and reiterate again, I take very seriously issues regarding financial management and governance and also ensuring that action is taken to address issues highlighted through the assurance processes which we have in place. It's essential that all parties take stock following each of the reviews of the position at NHS Tayside and that we all learn the lessons and make improvements for the future. I remain committed to immediately addressing the issues which have emerged at NHS Tayside, along with ensuring that the NHS and the wider health and social care services meet the needs of the people of Scotland effectively and at the right time. Therefore, as a starting point, I can confirm that the Scottish Government and NHS Tayside have accepted all of the recommendations from the Grant Thornton report, and I have re received confirmation that uh, the appropriate response to the findings will be provided by the end of June, and I'll ensure the committee is kept informed of these uh, responses. In relation to NHS Tayside, I think it underscores the, the need for fresh, strong leadership, which Malcolm Wright and John Brown are now providing. At a wider level, there are clearly lessons to be learned by all relevant parties, including the Scottish Government, and I'm determined that those lessons will be swiftly embedded into our existing control systems. In addition to the change in leadership at NHS Tayside, which I'm obviously happy to discuss in more detail during uh, the morning session, there is a, a range of other work which is already underway to strengthen existing processes to prevent such a situation arising again. The committee will already be aware of the work being carried out by Oscar in relation to the charitable aspects of the endowment issue. In advance of the completion of this work, Paul Gray has agreed with David Robb, the chief executive of Oscar, that consideration will be given to legislative change to ensure a, a clearer separation of roles between health boards and their charitable arms. The Scottish Government has also taken a number of actions to improve the controls around allocations to NHS boards. I was also pleased to note Grant Thornton's recognition of the work that has been done to date to promote an open and transparent culture within the accountable officer and director of finance groups. And I'll give you my assurance that this approach will be maintained, expanded and embedded as we move forward with the pursuit of transformational change in the NHS. And finally, to return to the transformation of NHS Tayside, I'd like to reiterate my confidence in the new leadership that uh, will make a real difference. I'm aware that the com committee members do hold Malcolm Wright in the same high regard as I do, and I take reassurance from his publicly stated view that the problems in NHS Tayside are indeed fixable with strong leadership and good governance, and I believe that he and John Brown are the right people to ensure that this is put in place. Thank you very much for that statement, Cabinet Secretary. If I can kick off with, a, with an opening question. The Grant Thornton report lays out for us um, a series of, I don't know better way to describe it, errors, blunders, a very messy, messy uh, situation of governance at NHS Tayside that led to the constitution being suspended and then led to the issue that I know you and I were both concerned about, Cabinet Secretary, that transfer of charitable monies raised in Tayside um, to core funding. Can I ask, to what extent can the public expect um, your office and the Scottish Government to be accountable for a situation like this? Well, firstly, I think restoring public confidence in NHS Tayside generally 
is hugely important. And as you say, people give charitable donations. They expect those donations to be used for the purposes of which they were given. Uh, I think what the Grant Thornton report uh, makes very, very clear is that these issues were uh, never escalated and reported to the Scottish Government. So neither I or indeed my predecessor, who was in uh, post at the time, were made aware of these issues that uh, emerged and uh, uh, that were decided upon, as you say, and the actions that were taken uh, in January and February 2014. So, um, that, I think, raises questions about both internal and external audit, where I think, again, there are lessons to be learned. When something like that uh, occurs, as Grant Thornton reports, shouldn't have just been a factual statement, but should have indeed been reported upon and escalated to the Scottish Government so that either my predecessor or I would have been made aware of this uh, well before the time frame in which we did. So in order to make sure that going forward, uh, all of these issues are looked upon. I think there's clearly governance issues, internal and external audit issues, and indeed making sure there's a culture of openness and transparency. I think what has emerged as well, and obviously Oscar is looking at this, is uh, that the behaviours and the retrospective uh, payments in NHS Tayside is not an issue being replicated in other boards, but Oscar is obviously looking at all of those uh, returns from other boards. And indeed, the recommendation for the separation out of the role of the trustee and the role of the board member is important because I think what Grant Thornton lays bare is that there was a conflict of interest with people sitting with those two hats. So what we will do is to take those issues forward with uh, Oscar and make sure that those uh, changes are made to avoid a situation like that ever being able to happen again, including obviously the, the strength and governance processes uh, that are already underway that Christine has been uh, overseeing. The Grant Thornton report says that there, um, there were inquiries to the central legal office um, to get advice on whether the suspension of the constitution and whether this transfer was going to land them in legal difficulties. Does your um, office ministry have any um, contact with the central legal office or did the central legal office, are they allowed or did they flag up to you that this was happening and they had been asked for this advice? Well, as I say, I was Minister for the Commonwealth Games at the time, but there's absolutely no evidence that that was flagged to the previous Cabinet Secretary or indeed uh, to the Scottish Government. The Central Legal Office, of course, we use the Central Legal Office for advice, but I think Grant Thornton lays bare a number of things. It says that the request from Central Legal Office was requested on the same day as the meeting. Um, that the advice obtained was never shared in its entirety with the trustees or the NHS uh, board. Certain sections were extracted by management and presented to trustees in the form of frequently asked questions, uh, but this was only extract. So, to be frank, I think the trustees, and again, Oscar is looking into this in more detail, and we've not had that report yet, but the trustees were only given part of the advice had they been given the full advice then you know they may have taken a different view so the central legal office provided what they thought was uh, a rounded advice but what they didn't know was that only part of that uh, was then uh, given to the trustees so as you say that was um the behaviors around that meeting were totally unacceptable and uh, you know absolutely unacceptable can I ask Paul Gray, same question. Were you made aware that the Central Legal Office had received such an inquiry? So there was no... Um, are the Central Legal Office obliged to flag something like this up with you? No, they're, they're not. Um, what the Grant Thornton report has done, however, is, is to cause me to reflect on the um, extent to which uh, other parts of the health service might consider escalating issues of concern either to their own accountable officer, the CLO is within NHS National Services Scotland, or to me. So um, I am reflecting on that and we'll have a discussion with NSS about and with the head of the current head of the CLO about points at which it may, the, the CLO may consider it appropriate to raise issues of concern if they feel their advice is being um, 
either partially used or, or, or not taken. Let's get this straight. The Central Legal Office is a part of NHS Scotland, of which you are Chief Executive. That's correct. They were approached that day for advice from NHS Tayside, asking if NHS Tayside could do something that sounds quite illegal. The Central Legal Office clearly had misgivings about what they were being asked, and at no point did they flag up to you as Chief Executive that they were being asked for this advice? No, they didn't. Okay. Christine McLaughlin? So maybe just a, a further point. I'm, I'm sure this will all come out more in the Oscar review, but the, the, the client confidentiality is an important part of the legal advice to NHS boards. Um, I, I think I would maybe say that there's, there's a very large difference between um, something that might appear to be illegal or, or inappropriate. The, the Central Legal Office would have given advice on the legality in relation to the 1978 mm -hmm. NHS Act, um, rather than in so much on the Charities Act, but they would have given legal advice. They wouldn't have um, been in a position to give advice on whether mm -hmm. something complied with, um, for instance, with the national guidance at the time. So uh, the, the, there is a, there's something that we need to pick up and be very clear on about the difference between um, advice about application of the law um, and something which has broader implications about um, fit, fit with guidance. And I, th I think that... It's interesting that the Central Legal Office act more as lawyers for each board rather than in-house lawyers checking that NHS Scotland is acting legally in all its actions. No, so the point I was trying to clarify is that they would have, what they would have been asked to give is, is legal advice rather than um, broader advice about fit with um, with the, the national guidance that we'd published. Right. So Oscar will look at all of that in the, in the round. They'll look at the legal advice along with the application of the, the national guidance. And the important sure. other bit about that is that there was an intimation that Oscar had also been asked for advice around that, which they had not been. There was no evidence of Oscar ever having been advised asked for advice, but there was an intimation again to the trustees that that had been. So the other side of, of that uh, equation it's, it's is, Oscar. Yeah, is Oscar and they were not. It concerns me that you're responsible for the NHS in Scotland and this conversation about potentially illegal action was taking place amongst officers of NHS Scotland, but it was never flagged up to the person in charge, Mr Gray. I'm going to ask Ms. Uh, Liam Kerr to continue with questioning. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, I would like to continue on that point because the Grant Thornton report seems to very squarely point the finger at the management of NHS Tayside as it existed at various times over the last few years. Uh, in particular, the former finance director uh, suggests that some of his practices and the culture were particularly challenging. So uh, the first question is, do you accept the analysis that this is isolated to the former NHS Tayside management? So the, um, the retrospective use of endowment funds, if we're talking about that specifically, um, the reason that we asked boards to give uh, returns to, to Paul Gray was to make sure that there was no practice like that. And the returns that we've had uh, do not indicate that the, the what happened in Tayside has happened in any other board. But Oscar obviously will be reporting on all of that in detail and we'll need to wait for their report. However, I think what it does flag up is that fundamentally um, there was a conflict of interest of the, the trustees sitting making decisions um, around the, the use of those endowment funds, while at the same time being put under pressure around the, the board finances and therefore being asked to wear these two hats simultaneously and make decisions based on um, the information that was given to them, the partial information that was given to them. So I don't believe that those behaviours and actions are, are widespread in the NHS at all. I think there was a particular issue of um, a lack of openness and transparency. There was a culture, I think, around decision making uh, in NHS Tayside, uh, which I think Grant Thornton lays out quite clearly. Some of the pressures, for example, brought on the internal auditor to change report the report uh, from the draft to the final. I don't think those are behaviours that are widespread uh, across the NHS, thankfully. The Finance director, as was, 
uh, it features fairly prominently in the Grant Thornton report. Uh, the finance director has now departed uh, with, with no process examining uh, his role at uh, various times. How is his side going to be heard? Is, uh, Grant Thornton, I think I'm right in saying, haven't listened to what he has to say about this. Is anyone going to listen to his version? Well, clearly he has retired. Um, you, Christine can maybe lay out a little bit about some of the, the further action taken, but um, I guess there was no, there would have been no obligation for him to speak to, speak to Grant Thornton. I don't know whether Grant Thornton asked to speak to him. To but, yeah. So, so you're, you're correct. The, the Grant Thornton review did, didn't um, didn't involve any interviews with um, anyone who was no longer an employee of the board. Um, Oscar, in their review on the issues in relation to the use of charitable funds, um, have the ability to interview any of the trustees at the time or anyone involved. So um, I, I, I can follow up with Oscar, but it would be perfectly um, within their, their remit to speak to any of the, the trustees at the time of the transaction, and, and the Director of Finance would have been one of those trustees. I think it would be worth finding out if the Director of Finance in particular uh, will be listened to, because, of course, there are some aspersions cast upon what went on, uh, and it would be worth hearing what he has to say. Uh, the Grant Thornton report also talks about issues, various of these issues that we're examining, being reported up to the board in 2013 14. So why did the Scottish Government not know about this if the board were having these issues reported to them? Well, I think Grant Thornton makes clear, and they, they say this a number of times, that um, they were unable to identify any evidence that demonstrates that the use of endowments was raised and discussed with the Scottish Government. What they say is that there was factual comment um, and that both in terms of internal and external audit, also that there was factual um, statements. But with something like this, um, you would expect that that would have been escalated and reported upon to the Scottish Government. I mean, I, as a minister, I would rely on um, that being the case, because otherwise, what we're, you know, we're, we would be left in a situation of. of all trying to go through uh, every um, set of accounts, trying to see whether there's anything in between the lines. That's not really how internal and external auditing processes should work. When something like that occurs, you would expect it to be red flagged, escalated, reported upon. And Grant Thornton is very clear that didn't happen. And that's why it, was, it has only emerged like four years later uh, as a substantial issue. So, Again, in terms of lessons learned, I think there are lessons for all of us. There's clearly lessons around the, um, the, the governance and auditing processes within boards, and a lot of that has already happened. But there's also issues for external audit, and we rely on that in terms of being able to pick up on issues. So, so just to clarify, for instance, a lot of things have improved since then, but what we see in 2013-14 is that there were things like ver verbal updates rather than written. Yeah. Um, the Finance and Resources Committee is a place where the real scrutiny should have happened on this. And yet, at the time that there were discussions with endowment fund trustees about a level of deficit, that same level of deficit wasn't formally um, in, a, in written documentation discussed at Finance and Resources Committee or at the board or indeed in the monthly financial returns to Scottish Government. Those same, uh, that same level of financial exposure was not... Um, was not part of the formal reporting, either within the board or to Scottish Government. So, so the the, the tie up with what was reported to endowments is when you would have identified it. Um, that that was a key financial governance weakness to me at that point in time. Um, there there have been a lot of changes to the and a lot of improvements to the financial transparency in Tayside, um, and the, the the director of finance at the, at the moment is is making more improvements to that reporting so that those types of situations will not occur um, now. 2013-14 is really the year where there's, a, there's evidence of that lack of transparency within the board and in reporting to Scottish Government. Thanks for that. The, 
concern I have, or I, I just need some clarity on something, um, particularly Cabinet Secretary, if I may, from yourself, uh, because you made a statement about this to Parliament in April 2018, and you said, just uh, as you've done here, uh, no health minister could have picked up on something that internal and external auditors did not flag up. Uh, and uh, uh, what I'm hearing is that that's uh, the similar point you're making. You, the auditors, we rely on their processes so we can do something about such issues. Now, I, uh, I might be reading this wrong, but I have downloaded uh, the annual report to members and the Auditor General for Scotland for NHS Tayside for the year ended 31st of March 2014. Uh, dated June 2014. And if I turn to page 5, uh, what I, uh, and I'll just read this out. NHS Scotland Directors of Finance were informed on the 1st of August 2013 that NHS endowments required to be consolidated into host board accounts with effect from 2013-14. And then at page 8, as such, NHS Tayside has consolidated the Tayside Health Board Endowment Fund into their 2013-14 accounts using a template provided. What am I missing here, Cabinet Secretary? Well, Grant Thornton um, is very clear about that in the report. They've looked at all of that, and what they've said is that NHS Tayside's Board's external auditors identifies the use of endowment money to support the achievement of financial break-even in 2013-14 within the executive summary of their annual report. This is a factual statement extracted from the wording in the NHS Tayside's corporate governance statement. There is no further commentary on this and no associated action identified. Uh, they talk um, a number of times about the fact that really you would have expected that issue to have been specifically escalated to the Scottish Government. Um, Grant Thornton is very clear Give me, that that did not happen. It does mean you knew happen. about it. The Scottish yeah. Government knew about this. Did they not? Because PwC in 2014 clearly said NHS Tayside has rolled the endowment fund into its other budgets. Well, the Scottish Government received the final signed copy of the financial statements at the end of June 2014, but Grant Thornton have been unable to identify any evidence that demonstrates the use of endowments was raised and discussed with the Scottish Government. I mean, this is an independent report, not I my have. report. Um, could I, would you, if, you, if you don't mind, can I clarify just something just for awareness? 2013-14 was the first year that the endowment funds were consolidated into board accounts. That statement you'll find in every single board's accounts in that year. Um, I realise that, that it, it adds a, another dimension to it, but there, was a, there is a factual consolidation of endowment funds for the first time in 1314 in line with um, accounting standards, and every board had a, a factual statement to say how much was consolidated into the accounts. That's, a, that's entirely separate from the retrospective use of endowment funds, which is later in the governance statement in the accounts. But if you look at all boards' accounts, it was a statement that we asked everyone to insert into their accounts to be clear the NHS endowment funds were consolidated into the accounts of the boards. So it's that, that particular paragraph that you're reading out is not related to this issue about the retrospective use of endowment funds. And be assured, if it had been escalated to the Scottish Government and indeed to either my predecessor or me, then action would have been taken. But it was not, and Grant Thornton uh, confirms that in their independent report. Ms McLaughlin, for forgive me. Liam Kerr and I are both looking at each other. We are not accountants. Right. Perhaps you can explain in sort of more understandable Sorry, terms I'll what that means. So NHS endowment funds didn't, until 2013 14, um, were entirely separate in their accounts and they didn't sit within the accounts of the NHS board. So when you look at the annual statements, you wouldn't have seen reference to endowment funds in previous years. Um, endowment funds were, for the first time, consolidated into NHS board. So when you look at NHS board accounts now, you'll see an inclusion of the income and expenditure related to endowment funds within the NHS board's exchequer accounts. That was a, a, a change just to accounting practice that, that just brings them into the accounts for the first time in 2013-14. So there is factual reference in all of the board accounts to say, for the first time, charitable funds are included within the accounts of the board. Okay, I understand. Is that, sorry, but it's, it's an entirely... But you're absolutely right that the accounts do later on make reference to the 
retrospective use of endowment funds. Okay. But that, that particular point that you're making is is not related to the retrospective use, but it is in the accounts. I now understand. Later on. But this this report from PwC goes on to say, as with any new reporting requirements, this change, which you've just outlined, increases the risk or error of misstatement in the financial procedures. Does that statement would that not require you to then check? if something had been transferred from endowment funds to core funding. So, so and I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure the Auditor General can give you a better explanation of this than me, but, but the, the, what that means is that as part of the annual accounts of the board, there's a requirement to check the factual accuracy of the income and expenditure related to endowment funds. Um, in doing so, the external auditor relies on the external audit of the endowment funds. To, to verify those those amounts. So you're right, it, it does include, it, it increases the risk of um, misstatement because you're relying on the external audit of the endowment fund to make sure those numbers are, are accurate. Um, the, the, the point, I think, in the accounts is there, there is then a, a separate statement about the retrospective use of endowment funds, which is in the accounts, and that's the point at which there is reference to, to this transaction. I'm happy to follow up and, and clarify that. It, I think I would differentiate between a technical accounting consolidation, um, which is in all board accounts, versus the retrospective use of endowment funds, which just relates to Tayside. OK, Liz Smith. Just one question, Convener. May I ask, uh, given that change, would that have been something that would be flagged up to OSCAR? In term, would OSCAR, in its audit uh, of charitable funds, would it have, it would obviously know about that change, um, therefore, can we expect in the Oscar report some further information about who knew what when? Um, so the, the, the endowment funds are, are audited every, every year. Um, endowment funds as a set of accounts are um, submitted to Oscar um, and are on Oscar's website. So that process didn't change at all. What, what was new in that year was that the accounts were then also consolidated into board accounts. So I would see that probably as beyond Oscar's remit. I can certainly clarify that for you. Uh, that, that would be very helpful, convener, because I think what we're trying to establish is, you know, who did know uh, what when, um, particularly as it seems that like it was a four-year period um, before the, the issue was really properly flagged up. And then the Cabinet Secretary has rightfully said in Parliament that there are issues about the audit trail. And I think it would be very helpful if we can uncover exactly who knew what when. I mean, I think the Oscar report obviously is going to focus particularly on the, uh, the, the role of the trustees and the endowments and... Um, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see what what they uh, what they produce. Thank you. I mean, this is really concerning because you've got a situation where NHS Scotland directors of finance, Audit Scotland, the Scottish government all knew that there was this change in accounting practices that endowment funds would suddenly be within board accounts for that year, but nobody thought to check across the health boards that any health board was taking advantage of this by transferring funds from endowment to core funding. It looks like that's exactly what Ta NHS Tayside did. They took advantage of this new accounting mechanism that you had put in place, but nobody thought to check that. that I, I don't think that that's... Um that's an accurate reflection. That the, well, what is the, an the, accurate reflection? The ability to use endowment funds for um, the advancement of health is what the, the, the 1970 Act allows you to do. The consolidation of accounts, I think, is um, to see that as something you can take advantage of, I think, is, in, is incorrect. It was merely about including the accounts in the board accounts you, at the you, end. You may disagree with my wording, taking advantage, but... You've changed the accounting standards for NHS boards. Endowments suddenly become part in 2013-14, and we find that in 2013-14 financial year, NHS Tayside have transferred in charitable funds over into core funding. Is that not a huge coincidence? And did nobody think that there are new accounting standards, so somebody must check that charitable funds aren't ending up where they shouldn't be, which is exactly what happened in Tayside? That the point I would make is that that could have happened in, in any year. It wasn't related. I think is, I did nobody you. think to check that because of the new accounting standards? Well, I think we're talking about two different things. No, I, think I don't think we are. Can I ask Christy McLaughlin that, that question? Did your office think to check that these funds were not being transferred because of these new arrangements? Well, what, what we did was we, we put um, guidance to boards about the, 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 ways in, the way in which the consolidation would, um, would happen and what you would show in your accounts. The, the use of endowment funds, um, 
I, I think is is something that, that isn't related to the way in, to the consolidation of accounts. So the um, whether endowment funds were used for the, the, those particular projects in 2013-14 or the year before would have happened in exactly the same way. This is merely about including the values in the accounts at the year end. It didn't allow, um, if, if I'm giving you the impression that the board suddenly had a mechanism to use that wasn't there before, that's, that's not the case. The mechanism by which you can um, use endowment funds was exactly the same in that year as it was the year before. Same, was there was a change in accounting practice that brought these two things together. It and it the says accounts, in the right. PwC report that that increases the risk of error or misstatement in financial procedures. And what I'm asking you was, did you not recognise that risk and think to check it? So we, 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 we did recognise the risk. We issued guidance to the boards on how to, how to undertake the consolidation. Um, the role of the auditors then is to take assurance on the external audit of the endowment funds to, to ensure that it was the, the correct values, including in the accounts. Of taking of dealing with that risk was to issue guidelines. It wasn't to check the accounts. Well, it was to issue guidelines and to ensure that the, the accounts were consolidated accurately and that the um, the annual accounts process would include that within part and of it. OK, I'm going to move on. Audit's job. Yes, to check which we're going to come on to. I'd Ian Gray. to provide some further guidance on what I've just said, if that would be helpful. That might be useful, yeah. Ian Gray. Um, thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I wanted to... Uh, track back a little bit to um, one of the answers that you gave, I think it was uh, Liam Kerr, where you talked about the behaviours and actions which had taken place in NHS Tayside, and you said that um, you believed those behaviours and actions were not widespread in other boards. But the question I wanted to ask you, just for the avoidance of doubt, you do believe, though, that those behaviours and actions were unacceptable? Good. So, uh, uh, we've spent quite a lot of time prior to today and today trying to find out what happened um, in NHS Tayside and, and who did what. But I'm also quite interested, and, and I hope you will also have reflected on why these things happened. So, a, a number of senior managers in NHS Tayside undertook behaviours and actions which we've agreed were inappropriate and unacceptable. And I, I, I'm keen to know why you think they felt constrained to do that. There doesn't seem to have been any personal gain to any of them. In fact, a number of them have, have lost their positions as a result. So why do you think they felt constrained to behave in this way? So I, th I think First of all, that, and Grant Thornton confirms this again, that there was a, a culture that was a, a lack of openness and transparency. So as Christine was talking about earlier, the, the, the verbal reports instead of written reports. Um, and I think at the, the time, and again, Grant Thornton uh, talks about this, that there was a, a desire, particularly on the part of the chair at the time, uh, to uh, produce a, a break-even uh, position. Uh, now, um, there, if you look at the, what flowed from that and the pressure that seems to have been applied to trustees in making those retrospective payments, um, it talks about the, the consequences of not doing that for um, patient care, and I, th I think there's language about there would have to be cuts and so on and so forth. Um, and yet, what would have been open to um, the, the board at that point, if necessary, would have been a, a brokerage arrangement, which they ended up with anyway. Um, so I think Grant Thornton leads bear is that there was a, there appears to have been a determination to um, go down this particular route uh, to the extent that the pr normal procedures and processes were set aside to enable that to happen and that, and that the information that was given to trustees to get that outcome was only partial information that was provided. So all of that, to me, um, says that there was a, a, a process that um, lacked openness and transparency, and that uh, that was able then to lead to the actions that are laid out in this report. But, but surely what you're saying there, Cabinet Secretary, is that the, the chair was trying to pursue a balanced budget, which it was impossible to achieve. 
So, so what was driving um, those actions, which may have been covered by the cloak of a, a lack of transparency, was the attempt to balance a budget which it simply was not possible to balance. Is that not Well, not but fair? there were other options available to the board, like brokerage uh, arrangements. We, there was obviously a but, lot of but, work... But surely, surely brokerage arrangements are not... Uh, I mean, NHS Tayside had um, drawn down brokerage on a number of occasions, hadn't they? That was the case. So, uh, 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 surely brokerage is a way of dealing with... Uh, 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 an inter, you know, a, a particular year where there's a difficulty in balancing the budget. Are you suggesting that brokerage year after year after year after year is uh, is eff effective financing of the the NHS? No, or this board? no, I don't. Um, but NHS Tayside uh, were requiring to um, get their financial position into a, a better place, and they had to live within their means. There's a, obviously a history. Uh, within uh, NHS Tayside of them um, perhaps not doing that in the way that they should. There were outliers in a number but of isn't areas. That the pressure? But the yes, but the, the choices that were in front of them did not require them to go down the use of retrospective use of endowment funds. They could have had brokerage arrangements in place if that had been required. They, cho they chose, or, the, or, or certain parts of the leadership of NHS Tayside at that stage chose to go down a route that required them to set aside the normal rules. This is not something that other boards were doing, so it was a particular course of action that, the, uh, that cer certain members of the senior leadership team within NHS Tayside clearly chose to do at that point. That was not the only option open to them, and they were wrong for choosing that route. I mean, I think we can agree that they were wrong for choosing that route, and it's, you, you've made very clear you think they were, mm -hmm. especially given the action that, that you've taken. But, but I just come back to, to what you just said, that they were required to get their finances uh, into a better state. Don't, don't, and you, don't you reflect at all that that might have been a pressure that led them to take these, what we agree, were, were bad choices? Have you reflected at all on the kind of responsibility of the financial pressures that were being put on I the I don't think there's any that. excuse for the action that was taken. There were other options open to NHS Tayside that they were well aware of, and those discussions could have taken place with the uh, Scottish Government finance officials to get to, to that option. That's what other boards have done <coughs> and, and will continue to do uh, as a, a way of helping them to, to get to financial balance. Uh, it, it was an uh, unusual... And thankfully, it appears so far anyway, uh, Oscar is still to uh, confirm this, but it appears to have been an, an isolated case. And I think that tells us that what happened was unusual and not the actions that, that a board would normally take, given that it appears to have only happened in Tayside. Okay. Liam Kerr. Just very briefly, and forgive me labouring a point, I'm just looking back at the PwC report that I referred to. And I'm just looking in the executive summary uh, where it talks about financial performance. Christine McLaughlin, I, I guess I'm putting this to you in the first instance, because it's been quite clear there was no flag, no flag put up uh, to say there's been an issue with the endowment funds. Uh, but I'm just looking at the executive summary. Uh, halfway down the page, in January 2014, the Board of Trustees of Tayside NHS Board Endowment Fund approved a number of submissions for funding totalling 3.64 million 2.71 million was retrospective spend. In total, the board has received 7.6 million of endowment funds to fund projects outside of the core activities within its 2014 financial plan. Again, what am I missing? Why is that not a flag that says there was a misuse of endowment funds? So that that um, that is the, the the factual statement that I said is in the account. So I, I don't think we've ever said that there, there wasn't factual a factual inclusion in the accounts of the transaction. Um, it, it didn't suggest... It was there to be seen by the Scottish Government, by the Scottish NHS. They knew. So, so that, that was included in the accounts as a, as a transaction. The, the, uh, that doesn't suggest that there it was an inappropriate transaction. If, if you go on to read that statement later on, it, it does say that there isn't anything um, that, that was inappropriate in the accounts. The board, um, as part of their annual assurance process, write to Scottish Government 
and that's a point at which um, the audit committees of any board should flag anything that they feel needs to be raised from the accounts. The, the letter from the board said that there was nothing to make Scottish Government aware of. So, uh, so my, my because PwC didn't write down, Scottish Government, there's something not right here, that exonerates the Scottish Government from any... Well, auditors would f normally escalate matters of concern to the Scottish Government. That is what part of their role is, and yes. that did not happen on this occasion. Because if it had happened, Alec Neil at the time, or me later, would have taken action. The fact it wasn't escalated to the Scottish Government and never came to the attention of ministers, I think, is proof in itself that that wasn't. Now, there are questions there about internal and external audit that really something as serious as this we would expect to be uh, escalated. And I think I, in terms of lessons learned, there are issues for us all to reflect Cabinet on. Cabinet Secretary, that. forgive me, but this report that Liam Kerr has was given to your office. Well, I have never received a report that says this is a matter of concern that a minister should so, be looking at. Okay, and as Grant so this, Thornton says... If you let me finish, so this report from PwC dated 10 June 2014 was submitted to the Scottish Government. Is that correct, Paul Gray? It's the annual report to members and the Auditor General for Scotland for NHS Tayside. Your office would have received a copy well, of this. And there's a factual and, statement in that, as we've just said. And the statement says that the, the retrospective funds were used, endowment funds were used to fund core spending. Is what you're telling me, Cabinet Secretary, that for something to come to the Cabinet Secretary's attention, it must have matters of concern or red flag written at the top. Well, this was included in well, a report that was submitted to your office. So, as Grant Thornton has said in the report, uh, if you, I'm sure you've read it, that they have been unable to identify any evidence that demonstrates the use of endowments was raised and discussed with the Scottish Government. But well, uh, we a factual have. statement is not the same as a matter being escalated. So, a matter coming to ministers would have to be escalated to ministers. That did didn't happen in the case of when but Alec there was Neil a report, was Cabinet Secretary. But there is a report happened. that has been submitted to the Scottish Government saying that this happened, that the Board of Trustees of NHS Tayside Board Endowment Fund approved a number of submissions for funding totalling £3.64 million, of which £2.71 million was retrospective spend. It is in a report that was submitted to your office. So why wasn't that acted upon? Well, I, I have never had a matter of the endowment funds, the retrospective use of endowment funds in Tayside escalated to me as a minister and but the Cabinet but can it say this report came to, to your office, Paul Gray? Is that not the case? A factual that statement you... is not the same as a matter being escalated by auditors. This is a factual statement. It's on it a piece of paper well, in and a report we've all that came to your a factual office. statement. That's what Grant Thornton says. It's a factual statement, but was never escalated to the Scottish Government so what, as a matter of concern. What, what constitutes escalation, not a report well, that has the words written? In auditing written. terms, there are clear processes for escalation that auditors would take if they have a matter of concern, and they do that either through qualified accounts or a matter that is put to the Scottish Government. That did not happen on those occasions. So, in auditing terms, that would be the process that happens in other cases. So, Cabinet Secretary, it's what you're saying, there's no point in PwC submitting such a report to your government because it won't be read, what will be acted upon is something that says matters of concern at the top of well, it. Well, what we would expect, and what, in terms of auditing process, we would expect is that if the auditors have a concern, that they escalate that concern. Not a factual statement as part of a, a report, uh, an audit report, but an, an escalation of a matter of concern. That is the role of auditors, to so escalate this report matters read? of concern. Boom. Paul Gray. I cannot recall if I read it in 2014. I, I, I'm not going to pretend that I know because I can't recall what I, specifically what I read in 2014. Christine, are you able to advise the route I, that that report would have taken? If, if I can clarify, so, so the, the board accounts um, go through, as you'd be aware, a level of scrutiny within the board, including the audit committee, and then submission to the board for final sign-off. Um, the, the, there is a, a, an extent to which there is reliance on that assurance process, as we've talked about before, between the internal audit process, the external audit process. Um, the, this, this, the ways in which things are escalated to Scottish Government would be if there was something raised that was a, um, a material misstatement, 
a, um, a suggestion of a Section 22 report. Um, but I would go back to also every audit committee writes to Scottish Government, and that is, that is a clear method of escalation as to whether there are any issues I want to bring to your attention. The letter Thank from you. the board says to us there's a nil response. There's no significant issues to bring to your attention. Okay. So just to clarify, that, that's the route by which we would take something as escalation. Okay. I think, though, it's disingenuous for the Scottish Government to say that they didn't know when this report with this information landed on your desk. Alex Neil. Can I just begin with the wee housekeeping thing referring back to what Liam Kerr asked about the Director of Finance. Could you, I know you might not be able to answer this just now, but could you let us know if Grant Thornton gave him the opportunity to talk to Grant Thornton as part of their review? I fully appreciate he could not be compelled to talk to Grant Thornton because he's retired. But in the interest of fairness and justice, I would have thought it would be fair to give him the opportunity for him to present his side of the story whether it's accepted or not, it's a different thing. But just in the interest of fairness and justice, now I know you can't answer this just now, but I think it'd be useful to know if he was given that opportunity. And if he wasn't given that opportunity, um, maybe you should reflect on whether he should be given the opportunity. It's up to him to decide whether he takes it or not. Can I, can I, and I, can I just correct the convener? There's a big difference between <laughs> documents being submitted to the Scottish Government and to the Cabinet Secretary's box. Uh, if every document submitted to the Scottish Government in any department ended up in the Cabinet Secretary's box, then, quite frankly, the Cabinet Secretary's job would be impossible. Mr. Just, that's not uh, no, that's I'm suggesting it went but, to NHS no, Scotland. No, but, but you were interspersing you... the two. If it goes to the Scottish Government, and that, this is important because of the point I'm about to make, there are many documents that go to the Scottish Government that do not end up in Paul Gray's box, never mind in the Cabinet Secretary's box. And I think it's understanding that flow. But however, having said that, I think, as the Cabinet Secretary said right at the beginning, uh, what has happened here, this should have been flagged up. I think we're all agreed in that. This should have been flagged up. We have a mechan mechanisms in place. We have non-executive board directors whose job it is to flag these things up. We have audit committees run by the non-executive directors. We have internal auditors. We have external auditors. We have monitoring teams in St Andrew's House in various functions. And despite all of that, nothing was flagged up to Scottish Government until recently. And this is the, about events that have taken place four or five years ago. And certainly, it was never flagged up to me. There was a problem. Uh, we knew there was a financial problem, but it was never flagged up to me that there was any problem of wrongly using funds. Had it been so, then obviously you would take action right away. My question is, Clearly, there is systemic failure in terms of picking up what has gone wrong timiously. Um, despite all this paraphernalia we've got and all the checks and balances we have in place, they didn't work. Now, obviously, the recommendations, Cabinet Secretary, you've rightly said you'll implement them in full, but I'm not convinced the recommendations of themselves will solve that particular problem. And therefore, my question to you is, are you looking at other ways, uh, whether it's early warning systems, whether it's telling the CLO to notify at least Paul's office if they have an inquiry of an unusual nature from a board or whatever, but are you looking at how we avoid this happening again? Because very clearly, had this been flagged up at the appropriate time, in the same way, you know, my predecessor, Nicola Sturgeon, had a similar problem with the waiting lists in Lothian Health Board okay. that were never flagged up at the right time. So have you looked at other ways in which you can, uh, we, we can in the future try to ensure that issues like this are flagged up very quickly? Cabinet section. Yeah, yes, indeed. I mean, the, the recommendations are, are part of this, but you'll appreciate a whole load of action has already been taken, uh, one of which is the, a cultural change, within, uh, particularly within NHS Tayside, um, that the behaviours here were only able to happen because of a culture that was 
less than open and transparent. I mean, the, the, you know, we've touched already on the, the fact that the internal auditor was had pressure put upon him to change the report. So there was clearly a deliberate set of actions to obs obfuscate the, the facts here. Uh, and so that, that's important. In terms of the action taken, um, clearly there is a strengthening of the auditing processes that uh, is well underway. And uh, the new chair, John Brown, NHS Tayside, has been very keen to... Um, to do that and to do that um, very quickly indeed. There have been other uh, changes that Christine can outline that have been taken forward uh, across the NHS. There um, is also the, um, the, the work that uh, John Brown has brought in in terms of the assessment of skills across the board to make sure that there's the right set of skills. I think the role of non-execs is important, but they need to have the information, they need to have the confidence to ask the right questions. And again, there's been a lot of uh, leadership training there to uh, empower non-execs to be able to do that. And again, finally, um, Christine can come in with some of the detail, but the, the separation out of the role of endowment trustees from those sitting on the board, I think is an important uh, uh, step forward because uh, it would then remove any any possibility of that conflict of interest arising and that's something that Oscar has already flagged the intention and something that we would want to do as well so I think that would would really ensure that you're not sitting with two hats on as was the case in in Tayside do you want to say a little bit more about some of the work underway that I think I think the important point you should say is how how do you create an environment where people feel comfortable to say something doesn't feel right within <coughs> that that whole system. Um, so partly it's making sure that there's clarity of the the, the financial environment in which boards are, are operating and that we understand the different sets of pressures in different boards. So partly what we're trying to understand is what what those are, the extent to which we really understand them, and, and that we better understand the the steps that boards are taking in order to. Um, provide that balance of performance and, and finance. Um, for me, that's the way to improve on all of this. Um, we, th there are some <coughs> things that we, that we need to do in relation to, to, to governance, um, mm. to the, the internal audit function. It's really, it's really important on all of this to make sure that you're focusing on the right things and flagging risks. And there was certainly some evidence in Tayside of things like internal audit actions not being <coughs> followed through. So for me, that's certainly something that I'll be much more... Um, aware of and looking at much more closely, because it is, I think, a very good sign of the pressures in a system, what types of issues are being raised by auditors, how are they being addressed, and in what time frame. And I think when we go back and look at the position over the last few years in Tayside, that's certainly been one of the areas that's been identified that, that there wasn't that follow-through of key issues, because most of these things were were raised in some in some way. And I think that's why you know, there's no effort on my part not to, not to be absolutely honest with the committee. I think things were identified its extent to which things came to sufficient um, clarity, I think, and that there was enough understanding of the significance of issues in order to make sure that action was taken. And that's why I want to focus on for the whole of the system um, and really learn from what happened in Teesside. Can I ask uh, two specifics? It seems to me the role of the non-executive directors has to have a big question mark around it because clearly they didn't do their job. If they had done their job, none of this would have arisen. And it's a similar problem as to the one we had in other organisations, such as the Scottish Police Authority. So what are you doing to strengthen the quality and the performance of non-executive directors? Not just in Tayside, it can apply to other boards as well. Um, question number one. And question number two is obviously, and Christine's referred to within her own department, but this is maybe more generally for Paul, about strengthening the monitoring uh, of boards at St Andrews House so that, because um, a lot of the recommendations relate to how Teesside itself internally should improve its checks and balances. But clearly there is a need for an ongoing um, <coughs> check um, uh, and performance monitoring in the widest sense. At St Andrews House as well. So it seems to me, as well as doing something about the non-executive directors, there needs to be a substantial strengthening um, of the 
uh, monitoring of boards um, in St Andrews House. Would that be a fair comment? I mean, I think that a lot of that is already underway to, to make sure that uh, that is the case. Um, there is also, I think, uh, has been a, an attempt to recruit non-execs from a wider uh, spectrum of society, shall we say, that brings in different skills and experiences, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, I had a session with uh, all of the, the non-execs across Scotland, and uh, really was making the point that they have a critical role in questioning, uh, but they need to have the information at hand, so the role of the executives in providing proper, open and transparent information um, is critical there. But I think expanding that where we draw on execs from is important in enhancing and building on those skills. Paul, do you want to say something? Yeah, um, yeah thank you. I think three three things to say. Uh, first of all, uh, to record um, that I've had a very useful uh, conversation with the Auditor General uh, about how we can learn together about what we might all do uh, differently as a result of this, because I think there's no doubt in my mind that um, this is something that we don't want to happen again, and I think there's a joint commitment to learning what we need to learn. Secondly, there's the Grant Thornton report, there are other reports, there's the Oscar report to come on Tayside and then the broader um, Oscar report on, on, uh, on, on other boards and the material that I've submitted to them. Um, and we want to learn from these, uh, the, the lessons that we need to learn uh, in terms of things that we might do differently. The Chief Executive of Oscar has asked <coughs> for a meeting with me, which I've agreed to, to um, discuss how we might best uh, strengthen the governance of endowment funds um, and bring in that separation that I think, uh, as I said at my last appearance at the committee, we're all committed to. Um, John Brown and Susan Walsh have uh, undertaken a review of governance in NHS Highland with the clear intention that that should have broader applicability across all boards. And turning to your point about monitoring from within the health director, it's, yes, you're right, but what I want to be absolutely clear about here is that we, we have a presenting problem here, which is an issue arose in Tayside, wasn't escalated and therefore wasn't acted on, but can we make absolutely sure that what we do is not simply designed to fix one presenting problem, which might not happen again, but rather is designed to ensure that where we can strengthen the monitoring, we do so. So I think we're, we're, we're trying to address this on a number of fronts. In terms of non-executive director uh, development, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, we're already engaged in that and have already drawn out some of the lessons of Tayside from the, for the rest of the non-executive director cohort. And you'll recall yourself, Mr Neil, that we had significant issues in NHS Lanarkshire at the end of 2013, part of which arose from um, weak questioning by the board. And we did substantial development with that board and have brought about um, something of a transformation there. And again, we're ensuring that the lessons from that are being spread to other boards as well. Sir Lewis Ritchie has been uh, retained to work with NHS Tayside in his audit advisory group function to ensure that there's strengthening and support for the uh, non-executive directors there too in terms of their development. So we're trying to address this in terms of board scrutiny, internal scrutiny, and subject to the fact that clearly we don't direct Audit Scotland, a discussion with them about their external scrutiny as well. So we're, we're trying to tackle this on a number of fronts. Thank you, Mr. Gray. You said the skills review was taking place NHS Highland. You mean NHS Tayside, just for the official it's, report? Sorry. Or there is, is a there is a review. No, no. I, no. I, you're right to ask. John Brown is doing a skills review in Tayside, but he was also prior to this commission to do work in Highland with Susan Walsh. It's the work in Highland with Susan Walsh that is designed to have broad applicability, although we will clearly learn from what comes out of Tayside as well. OK, so they are doing a skills assessment of the board at NHS Tayside, as per your letter. That is absolutely yeah, correct. But great. what I'm saying is there, is also, there was also another separately yeah. and unrelated mm -hmm. 
Commission piece of work, but it was relevant to my response to Mr Neil. Thank you very much. Colin Beattie. Thank you. I'd like, uh, firstly, to raise the question of the KPMG investigation of e-health funds. We've received a heavily redacted uh, summary of the findings and conclusions here, uh, and there are key areas that are missing, such as governance weaknesses, which are referred to in the contents but don't actually appear. Would it be possible to get the full report? Yes, yes, I, I, I think that, sh that should absolutely be possible. Christine, you want to the board was just going through their internal clearance with the auditors, and um, there's a, a that, that was a report that was largely written for internal consumption, so it's a lot of references to individual members of staff, and they just need to ensure that they've dealt with that appropriately, and then they'll, they'll get the full report released to the committee. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, possibly this question is more for Paul Gray, but I assume that NHS as a whole have some sort of risk register which is monitored periodically. I assume by now Tayside is uh, fairly prominent on that. What is the criteria for appearing on that risk monitor? Is it if you get Section 22 reports? Is it if you, if you require brokerage? At what point did Tayside appear on that risk register? I'm, I'm happy to take that, yeah, Cabinet Secretary. And Christine, Christine can, can add. Um, the criteria for uh, appearing at, if you like, Health and Social Care Management Board on the risk register are not... Uh, confined to two or three aspects. So um, they, they would cover financial risk, they would cover governance risk, they would cover performance risk, and they would cover people, HR type risks. So um, if any of the relevant directors, so the director of finance, <laughs> the director of performance, the director of people, if any of them were to, were to feel that there was a risk based on their monitoring that was material and sufficient to cause it to be escalated, that, that's how that would happen. It would, it, the, the, we, we try not to narrow the criteria because sometimes risks can emerge in, in different ways. And if you have a narrow set of criteria, you end up excluding genuinely material risks because they don't quite meet some fixed criteria. So at what point would uh, Tayside have appeared? On the on on the risk on the register, register. Um, you may not have that. I, I can give you. I, I mean, why don't I write to the committee? But what I can say it was that it was sufficiently high on the risk register that by March 2017 we had agreed to put in place the audit ad advisory group. So it had appeared sometime prior to that. Cabinet Secretary, one of the things that highlighted in this report <laughs> is the number of people that appear to have been complicit in covering up the situation that arose. It, as, a, as a culture, it seems astonishing. You sometimes get one or two people, but here we're talking about the Director of Finance, the de Deputy Director of Finance, you're talking about HR even, you're talking about uh, internal audit. It, it just seems like across the board there, there, was, there was this culture. It's very difficult to get your head around how it came about yeah, uh, there, as we've touched on earlier in the session, there was certainly a culture that was less than open and, and transparent, and that led to um, a series of behaviours that were uh, not only tolerated, but actually became dominant in some of the, the key um, decisions that were made. So if you look, for example, the, what the thing that jumped out at me was the the, the pressure put upon the internal auditor to, to change a report. Um, thankfully, these behaviours I think are unusual um, to the extent that they become a dominant culture. I, I, I don't. I haven't seen that level of behaviour uh, anywhere else. We have had problems elsewhere in, in other boards um, in, in various aspects, but, but the, the lack of openness and transparency and this, the culture within Tayside at that time, um, I think, is in a bit of a league of its own, to be honest. And the um, behaviours that then followed from that um, are laid bare in the, the Grant Thornton report, which is why one of the things that the, the new leadership team um, have done is to, to focus on a change of culture. 
that um, the requires to be openness and transparency. There, uh, there requires and needs to be uh, a culture where people can feel they can raise uh, concerns. Um, and that has been very much the message that they've imparted to the leadership team within the NHS Tayside, but also the staff, uh, that that should be the culture. Now, that might take time, but uh, I think it's absolutely the right thing to do. Are you satisfied there's been a, a similar change of culture within internal audit? Because I'm looking at what's been happening here with internal <coughs> audit reports and so on being presented by management, yeah. not by internal audit. Yeah. Poor, poor quality uh, recommendations. Um, lengthy audit reports that probably people didn't understand very well. It, it just seems like they were complicit in the whole thing. Well, the, the lack of information, partial information, verbal reports instead of written reports, who presented report, it's all part of the same picture of um, uh, an attempt to um, provide at best partial information to those who were then expected to make decisions. Uh, about that. Now, I'm sure there'll be more that will come out in the Oscar report around the specifics around the, the role of the, the trustees within that. Uh, but without a doubt, um, uh, the, the changes that have taken place um, are important in the way, so the mechanics of reporting, these are things that um, are now in place about written reports and so on. Um, but that in itself is, is important, but so is the cultural change to go alongside that, so that there's, there's not an attempt to provide uh, partial information. That shouldn't be uh, what uh, people are trying to do. So as well as the mechanics of openness and reporting, um, the, the cultural change is also uh, important too. As far as internal audit is concerned, two things. Firstly, are they still the internal auditors to NHS Tayside? And secondly, if they are, are we satisfied that they're now doing the job properly? Changes in the. Do you want to just, just to clarify? I know that's something that um, that you'd asked me about last time that I was here, and we given some information following the last appearance about the internal auditors, but also to say that the, the board of NHS Tayside have um, signed off on a, um, a a review, which is which is good practice for internal audit. Um, it's a, an external evaluation on the, um, the, the the internal audit standards. That, that any internal audit should follow, um, and that's going to happen in June, just to, to, to look at the effectiveness of the current um, internal audit um, system of controls within Tayside and areas for improvement from that. I think that's a really good first step. Um, it's good practice really for, for any board, and I think we'll be looking to ensure that that's in place across all of the NHS. But this same audit group, which I believe is internal to the NHS, it provides audits, internal audit services elsewhere within NHS. Are we satisfied they're doing their job there? So, so there is actually, there already was, as, as part of good practice um, re reviews, external quality <coughs> assessment reviews of the functions, um, and FTF who provide that in-house team are part of that review. So I think I'd like to see what comes out of that and what the areas for improvement are. But as, as you've mentioned, things that were made in the report about um, management, report, uh, management presenting reports, um, that lack of clarity, and in particular lack of follow through and actions are all things that the, um, the the new leadership have already got underway to make improvements on that already. So I think we'll do that review, but I think you'll see um, improvements already in starting to take place. Just, just Paul Gray wants to come in. It was on that point, Mr. Reti, uh, thank you, convener, if I may. Um, it, it was simply one of the things I should have said to the committee in my earlier response was that uh, the Auditor General and I have also discussed um, the importance we both attach to ensuring that internal audit is both um, robust and protected. And I've also discussed that with the Director General for Scottish Exchequer within Scottish Government. And we will be um, following that up. Uh, not just in the context of Tayside, but more generally, to ensure that the internal audit function, as I say, is sufficiently robust to bring information uh, that needs to be brought and escalate it to where it needs to be escalated to, 
that it is protected. In other words, some of the evidence within the Grant Thornton report is that the internal auditors were put under pressure about their own positions and their own future. That's completely unacceptable. I think I made that clear at a previous committee appearance, but I wanted to give the committee assurance that we are following that up now uh, and, and we'll hope to make further progress on it quickly. Just coming back to internal audit clearly failed. It didn't do its job. It should, have, it should have been escalating things past the management, if necessary, if they were having problems and if they were having difficulties with uh, being uh, intimidated or anything. But the external auditors have been signing off every year saying that internal control is appropriate. I mean, is, is, should external audit be able to pick up that internal audit is failing? I think there are lessons for internal and external audit, and I know that the the discussions that um, that Paul's been having um, are important in that respect. Look, I mean, there's clearly lessons I think for all parts of of the system here, whether it's the internal controls, the reporting mechanisms, the culture, <coughs> internal audit, external audit. I think that all lessons have to be learned to make sure that there is a tightening up there, that things are appropriately escalated um, when there is a, a matter of concern, and that if we get all of that right, then it will ensure that something like this could never happen again. Colin, do you have a further <clears throat> question? I was just going to ask a general question again about uh, internal audit. Are we satisfied that across the NHS, <laughs> internal audit is doing its job and that external audit is interfacing as it should with internal audit in order to ensure that this sort of situation can't arise again. Because I see this, <coughs> I see this largely arising because of failures in the audit system. Can I have brief answers to that, please? Well, think... ...that are being put in place uh, will we'll deliver that. Some of that's already happened, some of it's in the process of happening, and I think it will, uh, well, I'm sure it will deliver those, those additional assurances. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. Can hear. Good morning, everybody. Um, could I just start by asking a, a simple question? Has the endowment funds been returned to the endowment trust and to effectively be replaced by brokerage now? So the 3.6 million will be. Um, it, do you want it will be in this financial year. The agreement has been made to make that transaction in 2018-19. And it will be, presumably, the issue will be replaced by brokerage anyway. We've already offered additional oh. brokerage to make sure we don't want this impacting on... Uh, patient services, so it will be part of their uh, brokerage arrangements. And of course, there's a new recovery plan being worked on by the new leadership team, which uh, will, I think, be um, robust and will give us all renewed and additional confidence in them being able to get back into financial balance over a period of time. I mean, you said yourself, Cabinet Secretary, that we would have probably ended up where we are anyway in giving the board brokerage, but I think Ian Gray mentioned earlier on, this is not the first time the NHS T side have requested bro brokerage. I think it's maybe five or six years in a row now. What is our role, uh, Scottish Government NHS, in intervening in repeat situations like that to try and assist the board to get their books on balance? So, obviously, a lot of work. I laid out in the statement uh, to Parliament um, all of the work that had gone on to support the board in their journey to recovery, both in terms of financial recovery, making sure that they were living within their means and that they were not, um, you know, they were tackling some of the areas where they were outliers. All of that uh, was um, work that was uh, ongoing and supported to a, a great extent. Uh, by the assurance process, is the external support. Um, and, um, however, uh, at the point at which uh, Paul Gray had um, had uh, the the final um, recovery plan was being reported upon, we then had, as you probably recollect, the issues of e-health and then endowment issues being raised. And what the new leadership team are doing is to look at. Uh, where there is strength within that recovery plan, but to make sure that what comes forward from them has a, an additional level of robustness, has the confidence of the leadership team and the staff, because I, I think perhaps um, that was a lacking in the previous 
uh, plan and that it is deliverable and it's deliverable against achievable targets over a clear time frame. That's the task that they've been given and I have to say I have more confidence now in the ability of, from what I'm hearing from the new leadership team of them, to deliver something that is robust and will actually make the substantial changes that needs to be made, um, on, particularly in the, on finance and you've been working with them quite closely. Yeah, and, and we expect to get a revised um, plan for 2018-19 by the end of this month, so next week we'll have the, the first um, draft of that from the new team. And in the area of making sure this kind of thing doesn't ever happen again, are we clear about the definition and the, use, the appropriate use of endowment funds? Because they seem to hang their hat on the scope of it being for the advancement of health, which could really be anything, really. Are we clear about what is and what isn't appropriate in terms of the use of endowment funds in the future? So the guidance has been referred to was revised back in 2013. Um, and uh, I think what we, we there's obviously wide scope in terms of, of for, the, for the, the, the benefit of health. But what is clear is that um, the, 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 what happened in Tayside with the re retrospective use of endowment funds was uh, totally inappropriate. I guess there will always be debate among the trustees about, well, you know, we've had this request, we've had that request, and um, and there are various ways that endowment funds are are used. I think the separation out of the trustees' role from that of board members will give that extra level of assurance that what the endowment trustees are focusing on is what. Uh, is that the appropriate use of endowment funds for those additional things that are not core services. And really it is about, yes, it's about the betterment of health, but it's about those additional things that can improve uh, health care for, for, for the, the local public. Now, guidance, I think, Oscar want to review the guidance further, which I think is a good thing, in addition to the separation out of those roles. All of that, I think, will get us to a position where um, the, we have greater assurance. Obviously, ministers have um, no role, I think, quite rightly, in the, uh, the spend of endowment funds because they are charitable and Oscar has very clear rules. But I think Oscar themselves have recognised that the guidance needs uh, to be revised and that the separation of those roles is important. Yeah, um, on the internal audit issue that my colleague Colin Beattie was leading on, Cabinet Secretary, you've mentioned several times yourself in the Grant Thornton report that the internal audit report on the use of the endowment funds was changed from their draft report um, and the paragraph I'll quote here exactly says the chief internal auditor informed us that the director of finance and an assistant director of finance put pressure on him to amend the covering paper. At a meeting on the 5th of May to discuss the internal, internal audit annual report there were alleged threats made including those of the potential removal of that internal audit function as internal auditors or the removal of him as chief internal auditor. That's incredibly serious commentary to be made and I know you've referred to it several times and so has Mr Gray. What is the Scottish Government doing to try to pin down exactly what happened here to make certain that can, can never happen again? So, so you're right, they are very serious indeed. They, they do, Grant Thornton, does then go on to say they've been unable to substantiate these allegations, but note that there were changes uh, between the draft and final versions of the internal audit endowment uh, annual report. And Grant Thornton considered that the changes impact on the emphasis and reduce the concerns initially raised. So um, although they weren't able to absolutely categorically establish the allegations, I think reading between the lines, there was obviously something happened between the draft and the, the final report. So um, again, Christine <coughs> has laid out some of the, the, the work that has been undertaken about, um, about reporting, how um, making sure that this reliance that they had at the time of, of verbal reports instead of written reports, um, and also, um, you know, the, the, the fact that there needs to be a, a process of openness and transparency, that internal auditors need to feel that they are able to raise these concerns if someone was being pressurised into going down a particular um, uh, route. So, yes, I mean, a lot of work has already gone on to make sure that uh, that, that uh, couldn't happen again and further work is, is ongoing. 
Uh, just, uh, are you finished, Willie? Forgive me. No, no, no. no. Liam Kern, I'll bring Willie back in. Oh, it's just my question. Mike, run. I think Willie might. Sorry. Willie Coffey. Thank you. Do we know if that draft internal audit report or that issue of the change to the report was escalated beyond the Director of Finance to anybody else? Um, I, I think that's the crux of the issue, is that, that there is no evidence of further escalation beyond that um, reported position. What there's evidence of is, is that the, the wording in the report, um, in the final report, was, was different and, and was not as strong as what was in the in the draft. Um, it did relate to the extent to which Oscar advice could or should have been sought. Mm -hmm. um, I think partly what's referred to in the report is that um, that may have been because there was a, a view that that would have been covered through the, um, the work of the Endowment Fund external auditor in the process. But clearly that, that failed to come to anything. But to, to be clear on two other things that, that should happen and, and be in place, so the, ex the, the internal auditor should be um, able to, to talk to the and, and report to the chair of the audit committee in any board. Um, so, it, so there are mechanisms to go beyond that sense of, of management intervention in any way, both, both to the audit committee, um, but also to have you know, good, good practice would also involve um, private sessions with non-executive board members um, routinely through the year where the, the both ex external and internal audit teams can talk in a private space to um, the non-executives as part of that scrutiny, and I think that there wasn't sufficient evidence of that kind of thing. So there are most certainly think areas within the strengthening and protection, as Paul said, of internal audit that we'll want to make sure are, are in place and operating effectively across all of the NHS. With respect, great respect there, I'm not surprised that didn't happen. If this is true, that threats were made to remove the persons as chief internal auditor, I mean, I, I challenge anyone to say what they would have done under circumstances like that. That's quite scandalous to, to have that hanging over you. Then I would, I would spring to the defence of the, the audit process here. And my last question, convener, I joined this committee in 2007 when we looked at the Western Isles NHS and they who completely ignored internal audit recommendations at that time. And here we are again with another example of audit recommendations being honestly and fairly presented and being changed by others being ignored. I suggest to the convener and to, to the members that that's not a failure of the audit process. It's a failure of people abusing the audit process and abusing their, their position. And the real crux is how do we ensure that we follow up and verify what auditors are recommending be done We've asked this over a number of years at this committee, and I think that's the key here, to support the audit process and make sure recommendations are carried out. How are we planning to do that? Well, I think the recommendations in Grant Thornton and also the uh, additional work that's already been undertaken recognise that, and that's why those additional steps of assurance are, are being put in place. Because um, you're absolutely right, it, um, there was a a culture which enabled that to happen, but the processes didn't pick up on that to stop it happening. And that's the, the bit that is being, ha largely has been sorted and is continuing to be addressed. Thanks, Convener. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Just very briefly, I think Willie Coffey's line of questioning is very interesting. And I'm just looking at Grant Thornton. Uh, and it, it would appear that the Director of Finance, the Chairman and somebody called the Assistant Director of Finance have, have been involved. Now, we know what happened to the Director of Finance. We know what happened to the Chairman. The Assistant Director of Finance, I think, is a chap called David Carson. Uh, where is Mr Carson now? He's retired from the board. Right, OK. From, from the board of... NHS Tayside. NHS Tayside. Right, uh, and so this was all happening concurrent with... Mr. Bedford's retirement as well. Just um, I, I'm not sure if the, the date he retired. Um, I think over a year ago. I think in, in the last two or three years he retired from post. I can confirm the date. Thank you. Bill Bowman. Yeah, thank you, convener. Can I just say, um, refer to my register of interests where I was a partner at KPMG, whose name appears in these 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 documents, and I had of course nothing to do with the. This, this particular report. If can I just ask some specifics, um, the Cabinet Secretary? Uh, in looking at the serious financial irregularities at NHS Tayside, both the eHealth and the um, endowment funds, which have been serious enough to have uh, to warrant your intervention, and we've had 
you know, descriptions of things like cooking the books. There seems to be one aspect missing from the dis discussions we've heard about so far, and that's the possibility of any criminal activity. Perhaps to be the benefit of public trust in the health board to rule out any criminal wrongdoing in these matters. Useful if you could perhaps explain, without prejudicing any um, legal case, what discussions you've had about involving Police Scotland in this issue. Obviously, the Grant Thornton report um, it will be looked at uh, in close detail. We've already accepted the recommendations have of NHST side. Now, if there's any evidence within that report, or indeed the Oscar report coming forward, that is criminal in nature, then clearly action would be taken on that basis. So, um, Christine, do you want to say anything more about that? I think all I would just say is that there is, there is nothing that's been, um, that I'm aware of that's been put to us so far that is criminal, uh, fraudulent or involves personal gain in anything that I've seen to date. But clearly, if anything did come to light, that would be something to be considered. But it's not something we've considered to date. Can I suggest you perhaps do, I mean, we have the misrepresentation of public funds in a you know, set of financial statements of a significant, a significant entity, not just looking over the whole piece of things. And I would ask that you might, um, you know, think about, yeah. think about that. Any evidence of kind of, yeah, we well, it's how you. I mean, I don't know for I, you I to define yeah. to define that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, another thing, um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you previously confirmed to me on the 17th of April that either the Grant Thornton review or a subsequent investigation would cover your own office regarding who knew what, saying that the investigations, to quote you, will get to the bottom of all that and make sure there is full openness and transparency. Can you provide some detail as to that process, specifically who in your office has been involved and what investigations or information they've provided? Well, through um, all of this in terms of the reports on e-health and on the, the issues of endowment, what we've said is that there we need to know, um, well, first of all, how this could have happened, what communication there was, uh, what the relationships were, and obviously in the terms of e-health, that has been fully investigated, both in terms of the e-health uh, um, uh, officials within the Scottish Government, um, National Services Scotland and NHS Tayside and the relationships there and how that was uh, allowed to happen. Um, and action has subsequently uh, been taken uh, um, on the back of that. Um, in terms of endowment, um, again, uh, the, the reason that the independent report um, was important was that there was an external look at all of that your own office and the papers and spoken to the people within that? Well, part of Grant Thornton's review was to look at what the flow of information was, who was told what, when. That was what Grant Thornton was tasked with. And as they've said, um, you know, very clearly um, about the, you know, the, the, the reporting mechanisms, what was um, what was provided information-wise and, and what wasn't. Um, we're very clear, Christine has looked um, in terms of any information that was um, passed at the time. And Christine, you want to say a little bit more? Well, about really, what I was trying to get at is somebody come and actually spoken to your people, been into your records. So to, to clarify, certainly for the for the e-health um, review, that involved the Scottish Government's role in that um, as much as the role of the other parties. So that was fully included in there. And emails were, were looked at and members of staff were spoken to in relation to e-health. And, and the, the outcome of that was included in the report. The, um, the report that we've got um, presented just now in discussing in relation to financial governance looked at reporting to Scottish Government. So there was no, um, as far as I'm aware, there were no interviews with members of Scottish Government. It was a, a, I mean, a, a look at documentation in terms of flow of information between Tayside and Scottish Government. One last question, if I, if I may, if we can. Just th this issue has obviously been spoken about that um, you know there's been a suggestion you should have intervened earlier in this and you said that that wasn't possible given that neither internal nor external auditors raised significant issues with you and following on from that you've said that there should be an examination of why these issues weren't flagged up by the auditors can we just maybe cut through the wishy-washy language here and say does this mean you believe the auditors general office failed in their duty to you uh, I 
think that they are no I, I, I wouldn't use that language uh, at well, all well, what I would say would is. is there are lessons to be learned from all parts of the system I mean we need to if we're going to make improvements I think we all have to take a hard look at what could have been done better what I would contend and I'm sure Alec Neil would f contend this as well is that had uh, any part of the system, whether it was internal or external audit, escalated that specific matter to Alec Neil's attention or indeed my attention when I came into post at the end of 2014, you can be assured action would have been taken. Now, if we need to then make sure that the processes of internal and external audit would do that in the future, and that means we all have lessons to learn. If they should have done it in the past? Well, question. if... Uh, of course, and that's why lessons need to be learned, because if that had happened, we would have been looking at this issue in 2014 rather than in 2018. Cabinet Secretary, if I can take you back, just looking for a little bit of clarity on a question that Willie Coffey asked about the repayment of the endowment funds, which I know you're, you're keen to see. Did you say that £3.6 will be transferred back to uh, the endowment fund account in NHS Tayside? Is yes. that correct? Yes. When should we expect that to happen? It will be during the course of 2018-19, so it will be during this financial year. Um, okay. so. so would we expect to see that back in the accounts by the, at the year end? Yes. Okay. Um, the original report, which Helen McArdle wrote in the Herald, said that over four million pounds had been approved for transfer uh, from the endowment fund to the core funding budget. Have you done investigations to see if that amount was transferred, and therefore where that different amount between I can't remember exactly was it 4.2 and and 3.6 million is that was that amount transferred and therefore is there s still money that that needs to be paid back is it is it going to be more than 3.6 no, million no it's not grant thornton specifically looked at what was uh, transferred and it was 3.6 million pounds i don't know where the herald got their figures from but you know this is an independent report that has identified 3.6 million pounds and that is an accurate reflection of what then needs to be paid back okay um can i ask the Grant Thornton report, which we've been talking about today, um, your office received it a week before we received it here in committee. What's been happening to it during that week? Christine, do you want to...? <coughs> so, the, 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 we've been um, just going through the normal process to get it to a final draft. Um, I think I said to you that we were expecting the first draft on, I think it was um, Tuesday of last week, we, we got a final draft on the Friday. So just a routine process of um, making sure it was it was fully complete and th there were gaps in it when it came at first that Grant Thornton were continuing to, to finalise and just making sure that they had verified everything that they needed to. So fi final draft on Friday um, and then it was ready for um, clearance internally on the Monday of this week. Been changed. It's it's it wasn't fight, it wasn't a complete draft until Friday of uh, of last week. Okay, so it's, it's not been. I I I wouldn't say it's been it's been changed. It just it wasn't complete. Well, Grant Thornton, as Chris has just said, Grant Thornton had additional bits of information to put into the report, which is what the final report. Okay. Contains. Is there any way the original report which you received can be made available? I, I can speak to Grant Thornton and see when the, the, there's there's a normal process at which somebody would say it's this is the, um, the the draft version that they would release and I'll speak to Grant Thornton and ask them to to give you that. Okay, we're due to receive. I think of all the six reports that are taking place on NHS Tayside, one of them is a statutory report, the one from Oscar. Given that it is a statutory report, what's your understanding of the process around that? Does that also come to you in draft form, or is it published directly from Oscar and made available to the committee and made public? It's Oscar's report. We have, we have we, no, no locus in that report whatsoever. No. So not it, doesn't, it doesn't come to Scottish Government. It's, it's an entirely independent report from Os Oscar. Have a, so it's a protocol. We didn't commission the report. Sorry, if one at a time. Sorry, sorry. Christine sorry. McLaughlin. <laughs> to just say Oscar have a, a protocol um, that's, that's published which explains how they undertake reviews and their process of publication of reviews. So just for clarity, there is no, um, there's no draft report to Scottish Government or anything okay. of that nature. So we'll receive the first report, the process is different from the Grant Thornton report. That's correct. 
Okay. And that that we commissioned Grant Thornton to do the work. Oscar had decided to do yes. their review. Okay. Themselves. But you can check for us if we can um, have the original um, the original version of the Grant yes, Thornton I'll, I'll report if that's that. possible. Great. Are there any further questions from members? Can, can I just ask the, the whoever put pressure on the internal auditor? to change the report. That's a fairly serious disciplinary issue. Has, a, has appropriate action been taken? Well, as I said earlier on, Grant Thornton then go on to say they've been unable to substantiate these allegations, but they do point to the changes in reports. However, the individuals involved, as we've talked about throughout the, the session, have retired or indeed one of us, the previous, the chair at the time, is deceased. Um, you have taken action in terms of professional so organisations. Um, as, as with anyone who is professionally qualified, it would be a matter for professional bodies to look at the actions of individuals um, and decide whether there is any action to be to be taken. So I think at the end of this process, then there will be a, um, a discussion. I've already had initial discussions with. Um, some of the accountancy bodies in relation to, to the events. I know they're taking a very close interest in, um, in the outcome and, and they, they will determine whether there's any, any follow-up or any reviews that they would wish to take on in relation to members of any of their accountancy bodies. It has to be a very clear message go out to everyone else in the public sector that that's not on. Can I thank you all very much indeed for thank your you. evidence this morning. I now close the committee's public session. Thank you.